Good morning. Wow, it's exciting to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm afraid that already I'm going to spoil some of the enthusiasm about the future by raising some of the issues that might loom ahead. So I do apologize for doing that in advance. Um, before I really start with my talk, let me tell, me, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm German. I work in Zurich as a social psychologist at the university. So I'm not really a roboticist or a technologist. And I did study computer science for three semesters, but that was a complete failure because it turned out I was not clever enough to code. Um, apart from my career failures, um, I was born with a physical disability. I was born without the lower part of my left arm. It's a rare condition called dysmelia. Nobody really knows where it comes from. It occurs about once every 100,000 births, um, and apparently it doesn't have a genetic origin. Uh, my research interest is diversity, uh, diversity in society, diversity at the workplace. Um, research is always a little bit of me-search as well. So I guess making the experience that being different from my peers by having a very visible physical disability kind of spurred my interest in what the societal consequences of being different are. So why I'm standing here today talking about the future? Well, I have this hand prosthesis, which is very much top of the game at the moment. It's the most advanced hand prosthesis in the world, the current model that you see here has only been released in May. Um, it's a beautiful piece of engineering. There is muscle sensors, well, there's electrodes, basically, in the arm that pick up the electrical sensors of the muscles. And with that, you can control the fingers. And in the fingers, there are pressure sensors so that the hand kind of understands the shape of the object that you're grasping. So, for example, these three fingers sense the touch of the bottle, stop moving, and this one finger here, since it doesn't sense a resistance, it moves all the way underneath the bottle. It's a, just a tiny detail, but it's really useful because if you think of this as a bottle of beer and you're very drunk at four o'clock in the morning in a club, and you kind of, you know, you, you're not as coordinated anymore, and you kind of accidentally just open the hand a little bit, the bottle will, won't fall down because the small finger still holds it in place. This is these tiny details that make technology great. Um, I'm definitely not post-human. There's only I don't have superpowers, unfortunately, with this. Kids always seem to believe I do. Um, there's one thing I can do that you can't, and that's I can rotate the wrist all the way. Um, which is what I call the party trick, because it's not really useful for anything, but it's cool to show off. So, and I guess, based on this combination of being a, a, an extroverted social scientist on the one hand side and having a personal relationship to bionic technology on the other, um, I was asked by, uh, by Channel 4 to, um, to uh, host a documentary that aired last February and will, in a slightly extended version, air in the United States um, on October 20. It's called How to Build a Bionic Man. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, and what it was, was a, we, well, our team traveled to many, many different labs and companies all over the world to find out what the current state of bionic technology is in terms of things that can go into the body to replace lost functionality. So what is the current state and what are current early prototypes? So we kind of went on a shopping spree and got together all these parts and prototypes and assembled them together into one kind of bionic Frankenstein, if you wish. Um, that thing was on display at the um, Science Museum here in London for a few months. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring it today because it's already in the United States, preparing for an appearance at Comic-Con there. Um, this kind of robot that we built, um, it just had a single purpose, namely, just, it, it was just supposed to be a showcase. You know, what does it look like when we put together all the different parts of the body that we can now replace in terms of leg prosthesis, arm prosthesis, but I, what I found most interesting really was also artificial organs. First prototypes of an implantable artificial kidney made of plastic that's not rejected by the body. A first prototype of an implantable lung or a first prototype of artificial blood 
where the blood vessels are made of nanoparticles that actually have the ability to bind oxygen. Amazing. I'm going to show you a brief clip what it looked like uh, in the end. Bertolt is finished. He's a walking, talking, blood pumping vision from our medical future. It's terrible. I've got to say, I do feel a little bit guilty right at the moment. Uh, Bertolt. Yeah, he should feel a little bit guilty because um, what they didn't tell me at the beginning of the entire project was that they're going to do a copy of my face and put it on that thing. Um, that was only revealed to me at a very late stage in the production. I, it was kind of a little bit too late to kind of bail out of it. Um, I was mortified when I saw that thing for the first time. Um, and I had a bit of an emotional diva moment there, kind of slamming the door behind me, shouting at the poor engineers. Um, who were having a great time. Anyways, um, what you see there, just in this tiny headshot of the thing, it's a bit crispy. I mean, if you just enter How to Build a Bionic Man on YouTube, somebody will upload the entire thing. Um, but what you see there already on the top is, you know, the artificial heart. It's being put already into patients. I mean, it's a very regular device. This weird pair of glasses is actually the outside interface of a retinal implant, which I thought was mind-boggling. Um, it's an artificial thing that's being implanted into people's eyes who lose eyesight. And then there's a little camera in those glasses. And this circular black thing that you see on the left-hand side of the glasses is actually a transmitter that transmits the image into the person's skull, where it's being picked up by the retinal implant, where the image is sent directly into the visual nerve so that a blind person can gain a sense of vision. All of these kind of things. Now. I'm not going to spend my remaining 12 minutes on going through all of the great, brilliant technological breakthroughs that we're going to possibly achieve, because frankly, that's not my area of expertise. I'm going to say a few words about my personal takeaways from visiting all of these labs and from seeing all of this technology. And those takeaways are really a little bit from a social scientist's perspective. Um, let me show you my favorite little clip from the entire program. To give you a bit of context, we were in a laboratory at the University of Southern Florida, where a team of researchers has developed a little chip that's supposed to replicate the function of the hippocampus uh, inside the brain. The hippocampus is a very central brain structure. It has loads of purposes. One of its central purposes is to access long-term memory. Um, the chip is designed to help people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, they're currently testing it on rats. My previous speaker was alluding uh, to that. So what they do is they take a rat and they put the chip in the rat's brain. They've done that with rats who had a damaged brain, but they've also, just out of curiosity, put that chip into the brain of a healthy rat. And the outcome was kind of a super rat, a rat whose memory capacity was 70% beyond the memory capacity of a normal rat, which of course would give such a rat uh, quite a bit of an advantage if released into the wild in terms of you know, memory for food sources, food supply, and so forth. I was supposed to talk to the main head of the research institute at the day, you know, the senior professor, very experienced of dealing with the press. Fortunately for us, he was sick on that very day. So the only people who were present who we could talk to were his underlings, people who had spent the last 13 years in windowless offices working on this kind of chip. Um, I, sorry, I didn't mean to come across rude, but look, look at one of the conversations that I had with one of these researchers who worked on the chip. Here is the surgery room. We prepare brain slices in this room. Brain slices? Yeah, yeah. Professor Dong Song has spent 13 years studying the electrical signals in rats' brains. Can everything that is in our head be reduced to electrical impulses? Is love, hate, fear, is that all just electricity? Personally, I believe so. The brain has billions of neurons. They talk with each other in the language of electrical pulses, like blip, 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 this kind of code. And you are learning that language? Yeah, we are learning that language. What about augmenting or extending functions of the healthy brain. Oh, that's also possible. We have shown that we can actually enhance the memory function. So you have a chip here that if implanted into the healthy brain, mm -hmm. 
increases the ability of the healthy brain by giving it a better memory, right? Should we do that? That I don't know. <laughs> Did you get that? That I don't know. That's what he said. He spent 13 years developing this chip, and when I alluded to the ethical implications, he said, I don't know. Um, well, it's, you know, he's not paid to, to investigate the ethical implications. Um, he's an engineer. But I, I, I took away a bit of an eerie feeling that there are some questions looming that potentially will not be answered if we just leave the field to engineers and to business people. Um, so all in all, um, yes, I think there is a lot of great technology that will enhance the human body in ways that we possibly cannot foresee today. I mean, you know, a hand like this is just the beginning. God knows where technology is going to be in just a few decades. But there's a few buts um, that I would like to sprinkle into all of the enthusiasm that is involved, with, uh, that is connected with these developments. Let me, and the first but, or the, the first issues that I'm raising is, okay, if we build great technology that will help people to overcome disability or disease, bionic technology, arms like this, they cost a fortune. This chip will cost a fortune. My prosthesis costs around 50,000 euros. That's the price of a very decent car. Who is entitled to this kind of technology if they cannot afford it? Um, let me show you one example. This, maybe you've seen this on the news, Matthew. Um, Matthew was born with the same condition that I was born with. At the time Matthew made the news in 2011, he was 14. Um, he saw this technology on the internet, he applied to the National Health Service for getting it, and he was flat out rejected. He was denied because the National Health Service said, well, you don't really need this advanced technology. You know, a kind of, kind of simple hook will do. Well, unfortunately, Matthew and his parents didn't have the cash lying around to afford one of these by themselves. So what did he do? He's a big Formula One racing fan. He reached out to his favorite Formula One racing team, Mercedes, and offered them a deal. He said, if you are going to pay for my bionic arm, I'm offering you in return the space on the socket of my bionic arm as a lifetime advertising space. And somehow that mail landed on the executive's, uh, executive's desk at Formula One Mercedes, and of course the story has a happy ending. The executive was touched, provided a large part of the funding for the arm, and said, and we don't, we, we not, we're, we're, you know, we don't, we're not going to advertise on your arm. And the, and the media portrayed this as a success story. Oh, look at this great boy. What, what a great sense of ingenuity. And you know, how, what entrepreneurship, right? It's this word of the time. And we all have to be entrepreneurs. You know, startup companies will solve all of the problems in the world. You know, political issues, hunger. There's an app for that or a business plan for that. I think this is a terrible story. We're forcing a 14-year-old boy to come up with a business plan to get the technology that he requires to overcome his disability. I think this is a terrible story. Do we really want to live in a society like this? Because on the other hand, our society cannot afford to provide these things to everybody who lead them. An artificial heart already today costs $100,000, and that's just the material cost, let it set aside all the costs it takes to implant these things, to do the procedures, and the, the, all, of, all of the following costs. So, who is entitled to this kind of technology? You know, who gets it, who doesn't? I don't know, but that's some of the questions we need to ask. And another question, what if bionics evolve? At the moment, this bionic technology, like my hand, is a niche product. These things only cater to the very few people who have had an accident, who have a disability, who have a disease, who require this technology to kind of come closer to, to, to regain some of the functionality that they have lost. But what if bionic technology provides more functionality to the human body, functionality that goes beyond what our bodies have been equipped with? What if I had a, an artificial hand that let me type 10 times as fast? I could put out probably quite a few more research papers than my colleagues, giving me a bit of an advantage. What if I could buy an artificial heart that would extend my life expectancy by 10 or 20 years because it's not susceptible to certain diseases or to stroke? The criteria we have today for using bionic technology do not allow us to answer this question. Look at this case. 
There's been a man in Austria, you see his hand on the left side of the picture, his fleshy hand. He had an accident, I think it was an electrical accident, and he lost the functionality in his right hand. The hand was still there, it was just paralyzed, he couldn't do very much with it. So two years after the accident, he decides to amputate this hand in order to replace it with a prosthetic hand similar to mine based on the argument that the prosthetic hand provides more functionality than he has with his existing hand. But if that is the sole argument, that it's okay to amputate a limb in order to replace it with an artificial one, because the artificial one provides more functionality, then the same argument would be valid in a future where bionic limbs provide more functionalities than the body already provides, right? It would be the same argument. We could chop off a healthy limb to replace it with an artificial one. And you might feel, God, but who's going to do this? But think of this. If artificial limbs and body parts and organs would appeal to everyone because they extend the functionality of the healthy body, this would be a product that would generate its, in its own market. It would be like the red ball of bionics because it would stop catering to a certain niche market and would cater to the general public. There's a lot of money to be made. And as soon as there's money to be made, and as soon as there's a lot of profits to be made, I think ethical questions are at the very bottom of large corporations' to-do lists. So that is another, and you know, I cannot answer these questions, but I would like to raise them in order to, you know, kick off a bit of a societal debate on these issues, because again, I think we cannot leave these issues to business people and engineers alone. Finally, my last point, it's an interesting experience to make, and this is a very personal experience that I'm making, is how technology changes the face of physical disability in society. Before I got the cool robot hand, I wore a hand that oozed 1970s. It was terrible. It was terrible. I, I'm not going to go into detail, but what it gave me was what I already had, namely a sense of shame and a sense of shortcoming. It made me feel incompetent in a general way in comparison to my peers. I tried to hide my disability because it gave me a feeling of inferiority. Now I'm sporting a 50,000 euro gadget. I've even opted to wear like a transparent sleeve so that everybody can see that's the Island Ultra, you know? It's like, it's like driving a big car with a big Mercedes star in front of it and trying to get a sense of self-worthiness through the technology on which you, or in this case, my health insurance company, spend tens of thousands of euros of Euros. And now it sounds awkward, and I wish I wasn't this way, but that has instilled me with a sense of pride and with a sense of competence because it has changed how people react to my disability. It used to be, oh, you poor person. And now it's, wow, cool, what's that? Wow, that's amazing. Especially kids, you know, they come running, wow, cool, mommy, can I have one of those when I'm big? <laughs> um, and yes, that's great. And it has, it has given me a sense of confidence, and in the end, it has made me, you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm speaking to you today. Yeah, so of course it gives me you know, a great sense of, of confidence and, and pride, but uh, because at, uh, lower um, bottom line is I'm no longer seen as incompetent. Suddenly, this piece of technology is giving me a sense of competence. It's changing how I personally perceive my being different. And we've seen quite a few examples and I wonder whether this may come to a point where it actually tips, where we see people with a physical dis uh, disability who have this kind of technology as so competent that we see them as a threat. And Oscar Pistorius is a great example. Some say the advances in... This is quotes from the press at the time where he didn't shoot his girlfriend. Some say the advances in technology give disabled athletes an unfair advantage. They call it techno-doping. His critics argue he had an unfair advantage because his prosthesis are lighter than human legs and have been optimized for running on all surfaces. So here we have a cripple, mind me saying, who's lacking both of his legs, and suddenly that's seen as an unfair advantage. So suddenly he's doped. And if that happens to him, maybe this will happen to other people who use this kind of technology. So maybe we will face a little bit of a backlash in terms of how our disability is perceived. 
These are just some of the questions I wanted to raise. Just food for thoughts, I don't have the answer. If you're interested in these kind of questions and more, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is Mayo, M-Y-O, just three letters. Thank you very much for having me here today.